name. Amen. Amen. Well, have you ever been in a situation where you were in over your head? A little out of your pay grade. Uh, it could be at work. Maybe at work recently, they put you in a position that you just go, man, I'm just, I'm above my pay grade. Or maybe at home. I, I remember one of the first uh, times I felt way, <laughs> way in over my head is, is when we brought our twin boys home from the hospital. We're my new parents. Come on, raise your hand real quick. Come on, let's give it up for my new parents up in the mix. Come on. And, and I remember... One day I'm playing PlayStation, and the next day I got two humans like entrusted to my care. <laughs> Someone say, over your head. Over your head. Above my pay grade. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, man, I mean, they're, st they're still cool, still alive. They're, they're thriving in life. They're two of my best friends in the world. I love them. We love them with all our hearts. But, but somewhere, speaking of kids, as they're growing up, and I don't know if this happened to you, parents, but they get a little too big for their britches. And they begin to question you on your parenting skills, your life skills. And somewhere, whether it's four or 14 or 16, huh? something shifts and they look at you like, man, you don't know what you're doing. If I took the keys to this family, and sometimes you just want to say, okay, cool. You want to pay the mortgage? Great. All you. Feed the family? Huh? Anybody? Parents? Where, where are you at? And, and it's interesting, and, and I see this in the text today. In Job 42, we finally get to this place. God, for, for chapters, actually we'll start in 38, but for chapters, he's hearing all these humans, his creation, his kids, questioning how he runs the universe. And it's so interesting, I think about, I've been thinking about this so much. The, the creator of the universe makes us, and he makes us in his image, he gives us freedom of choice, and with that choice, somehow, someway, as we grow up, we think that we can run the universe better than God. And it's the biggest problem that we face as humanity. You look all throughout the culture today, why are we in the place that we are today? Because I read the word and I'm like, yeah, but I could do it better. All across the culture. <laughs> the verse that I've been narrowing in on lately is Judges, the last verse of Judges. They, they, they did what was right in their own eyes. Sick. Just like the 14-year-old. Just imagine for a second if you gave the 14-year-old, yeah, all right, let's, let's do it. And then they just had to run. That's what we're trying to do as humans. So all these I mean, first it starts with Job questioning God. Then you remember Eliphaz and the rest of the homies come for chapters and they're, they're trying to tell Job, man, yeah, you were in secret sin. The reason why you were so rich, but then it was all taken away. Your health, your wealth, it was all taken away. You got some secret sin. And, and, they, were, and they were making this theolo theological stance that when you're doing great and you're obeying God, everything's awesome. And when you're not, everything's gonna be bad misrepresenting the heart of God, trying to be the 14-year-old, trying to tell God how to run the universe and how he does it. <laughs> and then the young dude at the end, Elihu, he, well, I can just picture him, just the young guy, like, let me tell you guys, you old guys, let me tell you what's really going on. <laughs> and I'm just imagining God. He's like just observing all this. Huh, when you're reading it, aren't you just picturing God just going, really guys? He's so patient. I would have, I in chapter four, if I'm God, I would have been in there. Y'all be quiet. I'm gonna zap y'all. You're misrepresenting me. <laughs> this many chapters. So patient. Kind of like you were with your kids when they tried to do that same thing. Oh, guys. I appreciate your desire to run the family to think that you know better than I. Let me just be patient with you. Many, many chapters. And finally, <laughs> someone say finally. Finally, he's gonna step in. 
And I wrote this quote, you could write it down. This is just an introductory comment. He's sovereign, we're human. He's sovereign, we're human. God finally says, you know what? I gotta give my people a little perspective. And he steps in, and I just wanna show you a few verses. He starts asking questions to really just shift their position. Job 38, let me just read a couple of these. Job 38, starting in verse one, says, then, then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Now just picture this. It's like God in a tornado. <laughs> Who is this that questions my wisdom? <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't that be great as a parent if you could just do that? <laughs> just hop in the tornado. Is that right, kids, you know? Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Look, how about this, verse three? Brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. <laughs> and for like four chapters, he goes, I wish I could read, y'all read it already this week so I don't have to read it all. But let me just give you a couple of the questions that he asks. Job 38, verse four, he starts with this. Um, so where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me. If you know so much, could have just stopped with that. Verse eight, Job 38, verse eight. Who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst from the womb? In that section, he's like, uh, who told those proud waves, you can go all the way to the beach and then stop there. How about nine, verse 19, Job 38, 19. Where does the light come from and where does the darkness go? And then in verse 21, but of course you know all this for you were born before it was all created and you are so, watch this, very experienced. <laughs> Isn't that what you wanna say to your kids sometimes? You're so experienced. I love that God has a sense of humor and you can take sarcasm a little bit too far. Okay, so again, don't. But God right here, it's like, it's like a sanctified sarcasm right here. <laughs> Did you read that? And you're like, oh my goodness. And then, I mean, for four chapters, this goes on and on. If you look at it, 77 questions God asked Job. 77 questions. In chapter uh, 39, he talks about goats, ostriches, horses, and hawks. I love when he talks about the ostrich. You guys read that? Eh, not real, real bright. I mean, the ostrich lays the eggs and just like forgets and probably gets step on them. But man, that ostrich can bounce. I mean, runs like a, like a 3840. I mean, the, the ostrich can ride out. Not real smart, but speedy. I was reading that. I was just like, in my personal time, I was just laughing. The ostrich. Why'd you make the ostrich? And he's, and he's moving through this text describing creation. Um, verse or chapter 40 talks about the behemoth, this huge animal, Leviathan, this, I think the sea creature. And in Job 41, 11, he, he asked this question, who has given me anything that I need to pay back? Everything under heaven is mine. What is he? He's just adjusting perspective. He's saying, I'm sovereign, I'm in control. I made you, I've given you this freedom of choice, but guys, you've gotten carried away. Let's get back to, to me in control. Charles Spurgeon has a fascinating quote, and I'm gonna read all of it for you. Um, <laughs> this guy, C.H. Spurgeon, one of the old school gangster preachers, listen to what he says. If inclined to boast of our abilities, the grandeur of nature may soon show us how puny we are. We cannot move the least of all the twinkling stars or quench so much as one of the beams of the morning. We speak of power, but the heavens laugh us to scorn. Then he goes on, when Pleiades, which is a star, I think, a cluster of stars, I don't know, 
shine forth in spring with vernal joy. We cannot restrain their influences. And when Orion, I love Orion. How many like Orion? The little three little stars right there. That's how my wife and I fell in love in the keys looking at Orion. But side note, okay. When Orion reigns aloft and the year is bound in winter's fetters, we cannot relax the icy bands. The seasons revolve according to the divine appointment. Neither can the whole race of men affect a change therein. Lord, what is man? Now, I could just put the mic down and walk away and be like, guys, it was just a reminder. God's in control and you're not. Who are we to question God? And it's easy for me as a preacher to stand up here and, and say that. But remember, Job is in the diciest season of his life. And we've all been there, haven't we? Like, why did this happen, God? And we don't understand the big picture and God's just saying, hey, and it's it's super interesting too, with all these questions, God still doesn't answer why, why Job is suffering. Sometimes you won't get the answer until you step into a heaven. Can we be okay with that? Can we humble ourselves before God and say, I don't understand it all, but God, you're on the throne and I'm not. And we step into this new season of maturity with God. So on and on it goes, Job's getting questioned by God. And with the question comes a confession. Look at Job 42 now. Move to chapter 42, starting in verse one. Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything. Good response. And no one can stop you. God, you asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. (laughs) Everyone, raise your hand real quick. It's I. I'm the one that's questioned it before. That's me. That's that's what Job's saying. He's, He's humbling himself. It is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about. Things far too wonderful for me. I was above my pay grade. I was in over my head. I was talking stuff that I just didn't have perspective to have the ability to speak into. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. He confesses. (laughs) Um, Parents, let's go back to the parents. You ever had one of your kids come up to you after they're grown up a little bit and repent? (laughs) And humble themselves before you and just say something like, you know, mom, dad, life's expensive. Thanks so much for footing the bill. Anybody, any parents ever have that? Or uh, recently, I, we got a text from one of our kids and they, and they just said, man, thanks so much for raising us the way you did. And you talk about like, like overwhelmed. And what was it? It was they're getting into real life and they're understanding a little bit more perspective. Job is getting perspective of the sovereignty of God and and, and all these questions pull out this confession and he's got one choice or another. He can get prideful or he can be humble. And I feel like that's a word for us right now too, man. Like we can get prideful and obstinate and like, I don't like what you're doing in my life, God. I can't figure it out. I don't like what you're doing in the world right now. So guess what? I'm just gonna get obstinate and prideful and stay stuck in bitterness and who I am. Or we have a choice to go, I can't figure it out. I don't like it. But God, I'm just gonna submit to your sovereignty and humble myself before you. So Job has the great response And if you're a note taker, first of three, quickly, he gets a revelation and then he repents. So it's revelation and repentance. Job 42, verse five. This is is wild. I was reading this and it just jumped off the the text, uh, off, off the pages. He says, I had only heard about you before, but now I've seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said. How many have stuff you said to God in tough times in your life that you want to take back, right? I'm with you. He said, I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. What do you see in that text? 
he finally has a revelation of who God is. I have no, I've heard about you. How many people just grew up in church real quick? Raise your hand real quick, like me. I grew up, I knew about God. I knew about him, but I didn't really know him. There's a difference between knowing about him and actually knowing him. I know about him, but man, in my truck in 1997, in a snowstorm, guess what? I saw him. There was a revelation that led to repentance. And that's what Job is saying right here. I've known about you, and I've really had a good intention to follow you, but now I've seen you in your fullness in a darn tornado talking about who are you, Job? And what happens in that position, he sees him, the revelation leads him to repentance, and he's like, dude, I'm sorry for what I just said. You remember, you remember Isaiah? In Isaiah chapter six, when the, in the year that King Uzziah died, it says that he got a picture of the throne room of heaven. You remember that? And Job, or excuse me, in Isaiah six, look what it says. He, he didn't be like, oh, kind of, that's cool, God. He said, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. What is it? For my eyes have seen the king. Revelation. Woe is me. Too often, if we don't get a revelation of God and I'm in control and I don't agree with what's happening in my life or in the world, what do I do? I become prideful and go, God, I could run the show better than you. I'm the four-year-old saying, I will run the show in the family, but I don't have perspective. That's what we're lacking. And it's not till humans get a picture of who God is, the revelation that actually leads us to a humble position. And for far too many years, even to this day, sometimes I place myself in a position of God, questioning him and his ways. And I get disconnected as opposed to, no, I see him and I fall be before his feet in repentance. You remember Peter when they were fishing. Remember when Pete and Jesus and the boys were fishing and Jesus is like, hey, I'll throw the, they were toiling all night. I'll throw the net on the other side. You'll get a catch. And what happened? The net was so full, they couldn't even bring it in. And you remember what Pete did? Pete's like, depart from me. I'm a sinner. <laughs> I'm out of here. What, what happened? He had a revelation of who God is, and God's in his boat. When we see him, we're not flippant, talking about, yeah, God, but I can't believe you did this, and why is the world like this? That doesn't happen. Those are two mutually exclusive ideas. God, I have a revelation of who you are. I am now repenting in dust and ashes. God, would you forgive me, a sinner? And you plead his mercy over your life and my life. So much more to say. Let's move on. Verse seven, if you're a note taker, um, sacrifice and supplication. So he, he has this discussion with Job. Job responds, and now uh, God turns his attention from Job to Eliphaz. Remember now, if you missed some of this, Eliphaz was one of, one of the three friends that first came to Job in his time of despair, losing his family, losing his wealth, losing his health. And three friends travel and they just sit with him and are quiet for a while. And then eventually they start opening up their mouth and that's where it all goes south. Falsely accusing him of, of secret sin and different things. So God deals with Job. Job has a proper response of humility. And now he turns his attention to Eliphaz in verse seven. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, I'm angry with you and your two friends. Remember Bildad, the shoe height? He was the smallest of the, the posse, right? remember? I'm angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken, this hit me, you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. He's, he's getting up in Eliphaz's grill. You and your two boys, when you came to try to comfort Job, you spoke of things not from my perspective, from your own human perspective, and you actually misspoke about me. Your, the your theology was off. And God's like, I don't take that lightly. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, someone else wanna preach today? <laughs> Kevin, how about you come up here, right? And you 
That's why in James 3, 1, it says, let not many of you become teachers because there's a stricter judgment. What does that mean, Christian? Be very careful how you represent God. There's so many people out here now bashing people that don't know God as opposed to looking at them going like, man, they are just, they just haven't had the revelation. How about we love them, build a bridge? We never water down the truth ever, but how, how about we build a bridge? I'm talking, that's representing the heart of God. When we get prideful as Christians talking about, you don't know what I know, we misrepresent the heart of God. Be very careful, Christian. He, he's, he's bringing it to these guys. And I was thinking of myself, like, oh, how am I misrepresenting God? Please, God, I got blind spots. I need to grow. I don't want to misrepresent you. There's souls at stake. So (laughs) in in verse 8, listen listen to what God tells these guys to do. So, guys, you've been off, but there's a way out. There's a way that I can forgive you. Here's what I want you to do. Take seven bulls, seven rams, go to my servant Job, and offer a burnt offering for yourselves. This is fascinating. My servant Job will pray for you, and I will accept his prayer on your behalf. How about a type of Christ right there? What a great picture of Jesus right there. (laughs) Job will pray for you. I'll accept his prayer on your behalf. I will not treat you as you deserve for you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. I was reading this and I'm like, "Um, if I'm Job and my three great friends just come and talk all this trash about me, I don't know how quickly I'm gonna be inclined to pray for them. I'd be like, "Uh," can you imagine the three boys? Um, Job, talk to God and I'm supposed to sacrifice and then I'm supposed to come to you and you're going to pray and intercede so I don't get smoked. I'd be like, I don't know about that. Getting smoked sounds kind of good. I've been tired of you guys anyways. (laughs) Fascinating scripture. How many times that, that, that they misrepresented Jesus and they falsely accused Jesus and Jesus was the only way to intercede for those knucklehead friends like you and me. And and I'm just going, I don't know. The the text when Jesus, by the way, real quick, remember in John 13 when Jesus washed his disciples' feet? Do you guys remember that? And I'm just picturing him like the king of the universe, it was such a good picture, coming down to this planet, taking the lowest position at the time, a servant, and you would come in with these gnarly feet, and, and, and the king is serving his people by washing their dirty feet. And I'm just picturing Peter, or Thomas, he's like, oh man, yo bro, you need a manicure, or a pedicure, or whatever. It's like, they keep on coming in. I always think of Judas. Remember, remember Judas? Jesus knew that he was gonna betray him. I'd be like, I got out washed and everything, you know. I'd take out like, like a razor or something at that point. Like, is that right, Judas? <laughs> you know, like. Huh? Wouldn't that be the tendency? But Jesus, what does he do? He knows what Judas is gonna do, stab him in the back, and what does he still do? He washes his feet. That's, that's what Job, he's got this, what do I do here? I love Jesus on the cross. He said, he said, Father, forgive them. Right at Luke 23. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They simply don't have a perspective. It's powerful. So verse nine. So Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, there he is, and Zophar, the Joe Namathite, he did as the Lord commanded them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Job leaned in when it wasn't comfortable, and he prayed and interceded for him. Powerful. So Job, like Jesus, bridges the gap. And finally, number three, oh man, as he prays, this is so key. This is the whole point of the message. Bring it to this point right here. As he prays, restoration happens. 
as he leans in, as hard as it would be to forgive knucklehead friends that have talked trash, misrepresented the heart of God, he still leans in, forgives, humbles himself, forgives and prays. And look at verse 10. When Job prayed, I want you to underline this in your Bible. This is a key concept. When Job prayed for his friends and he forgave them, what, did it, what happened? The Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, <laughs> the Lord gave him what? Okay, everybody put a two up in the air. He, he, what did he do? As Job prayed, as he humbled himself, as he forgave, what happened? God showed up and he gave him crazy favor. So write in your notes, forgiveness and favor. Two times, two X, Rex, two X. That's powerful. And I'm just gonna humbly submit this. I could, again, that's why I could be careful. But I truly believe many times we miss the favor and flow of God because we cannot forgive someone that did something to us. And what ends up happening, we block the flow of what God wants to do, the Father flow of favor in our life. I truly believe that. Last story, I wish I had more time. Golly, maybe I'll preach something and send it via email or whatnot because there's so much to this story. We had a bunch of young adults over on Sunday, last Sunday. It was taco night at the Dachshund's house and got to pray and, and worship and it was just a good time. Somewhere in the night, we got done eating and I'm washing dishes and they're going downstairs to pray. One of the homies comes over, he's like, hey dude, I don't know if you knew this, but your toilet's like plugged. And it's like this far away from overflowing. I'm like, oh snap. Thanks for telling me, dude. Like, <laughs> I don't know if it was him, one of the other ones. I don't know. It's, like, it's kind of awkward. Go to the pastor's house and plug the toilet. It's like, I don't know. And uh, everybody's having a good time praying. I'm, I'm like, what do I do with a plugged toilet? And, you know, we just moved into this house recently, and I don't have a plunger. And now I'm really in a, I'm in a pickle here, folks. And I'm like, what do I do? Well, I built a good relationship with the neighbors across the street. So text the homies, yo, they're like in their 70s, cool as people. And I'm like, yo, do you happen to have a plunger? <laughs> so awkward. Like how many people ask? And I was like, I'll get you a new one tomorrow, okay? I'm not bringing back that one. Bring you a new one. Go over there, get in the plunger. I just, and it's not working. At, you know, usually you give it a good couple of tugs and blah, 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 you know, you're good to go. <laughs> and this, this one was tough. I was like, oh, no finally get it done. I mean, at the nick of, you know what I'm saying? At the nick of time where you're like, oh, it's going to go everywhere. I was like, right at the nick of time, finally plunged out. I'm like, oh, it's clear. I was like, yeah. <laughs> what did I bring that? I, I, and here's the thing. Before your life gets out of hand and dirties up other people and overflows, could it be you're at a point right now where if you can choose to forgive and pray for the people in your life that you cannot, you've been bound in bitterness if you can pray right now and see what the Lord could do. Could he actually break the flow in your life? My, my wife gives this challenge, and maybe this is your challenge. The person right now you have, you've yet to forgive, here's their challenge. Pray for them for 30 days. What, come, come on, give it. Pray for you to have the Father's heart for them. Imagine Job gets the heart of the Father for his friends that just didn't have the right perspective. As he prayed, breakthrough happened. That's a word for someone in here now. I, I, I got a couple. I'm the pastor, man. I preach this all the time, but guess what? I live in a world that's tough and, and people take shots at me and they don't just come to my face and ask me to really understand my heart on a subject. And they take what someone else said and then they spread that all throughout, misrepresenting my heart. What am I gonna do? Hold up the, the bitterness or release it? I got the same choice that you have. We all have it. Forgiveness and favor. <laughs> Job 42, verse 12, we'll land here. So <laughs> the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life even more than in the beginning. For now he had 14,000 sheep, 
6,000 camels, 1,000 team of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. Literally doubling what he had before. He also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. Why didn't he give him 14 sons and six daughters? Why? Because those kids that perished were still his kids. They're in heaven and he's gonna meet them. Verse 16, Job lived 140 years after that. <laughs> it was so cool. He named his new daughter Jem Jemima, <laughs> Keziah, and Karen. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> Jemima and Karen, all right. Good job. He lived 140 years, living to see four generations of his children. How cool. Grandchildren. Then he died, an old man who had lived a long, full life. Was it easy? No. But was it powerful? Yes. And that's our prayer. Father, thanks for this message. And we just want to continue to lean in and grow. And what a great picture. Thank you for Job. Th thank you for this entire book. It's been so healthy for us to grow. And now I just want to pray specifically in the area of forgiveness. I pray, God, that you'd give us power to forgive and that you would continue to flow for your glory, in Jesus' name. Before